The Good Samaritan is one of the most well-known parables of Jesus. It's a great story. In our culture, and perhaps throughout the English-speaking world, the term Good Samaritan has become synonymous with a person who does good, a person who is charitable. Hospitals are named after this man in the story. There's a large non-denominational charity, Samaritan's Purse, that has helped suffering and hungry people around the world. This parable is well known for its message of helping others, coming to the aid of someone in need. And the general understanding that we have of this story is that, honestly, that we're the Samaritans somehow. Every time we help some lonely, hungry soul around the corner or on foreign soil. Now, the message of doing good to others is a great message. But if that's all we glean from the parable, we're missing the deeper implications. It's often the case that our 21st century Christian North American reading of this parable is at times actually infected with an anti-Jewish interpretation. We, in fact, often make ourselves the hero of the story, seeing ourselves as Christians, as the benevolent Samaritan who has broken free of prejudice And the priest and the Levite represent Judaism, which in this context is seen to treasure ritual over compassion and self-serving interest over the love and care for others. To see how far this interpretation is from the perspective of a first century Jew telling this story to other first century Jews, we can start by just thinking about that term, Good Samaritan. It's like an oxymoron. It's a familiar phrase to us today, but in that day, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. A Samaritan was the enemy. They were untouchable. They were not pure. So the term good Samaritan was an offensive phrase. So let's do our best right now to peel back 2,000 years of well-meaning domestic interpretation and try to hear this as a short story spoken by one Jew to other Jews. We begin by pointing out that Luke, he doesn't like lawyers, and this conversation is with a lawyer. But in the Jewish culture at that time, lawyers were respected. They were well-educated men. They were literate. Luke is showing us that the lawyer is not asking Jesus a question to learn something, to grow but he's asking it to test or to trick Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks. He's not looking for what it means to be righteous before God. He wants to know what he can do to check this off his to-do list. And Jesus confirms what the lawyer already knows. And just as the lawyer cites the Torah, the law, in response to Jesus' question, Jesus responds, likewise, citing the Torah back to him. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Jesus is reminding the lawyer that his place in heaven is not earned by following the commandments. Eternal life was already part of the covenant for the Jews. A faithful Jew followed Torah, followed the law in response to the loving promise that God had given them. Following the law was to prevent a person from sinning and by doing so, showed that you could have this deep relationship and love of God. Through that love of God, then, the love of neighbor was made manifest. But the lawyer is way off track. He's thinking that somehow eternal life is simply based on some good deeds as a commodity to be cashed in for or a reward to be received. Jesus wants the man to see that eternal life is a gift freely given. And that the life of righteousness is a response to the gift. The lawyer focuses on his own salvation, but the teaching of Judaism and the Torah is actually focused on loving God and on loving others. The lawyer is most likely looking for adulation. Looking to hear Jesus say, oh, you're such a wonderful spiritual and righteous guy. How far off base is our lawyer? He thinks in terms of a single action rather than a life of righteousness. He thinks of it as a commodity rather than a gift freely given. He focuses on eternal life, his own salvation, when he should be, as Judaism teaches, focused on loving God and loving neighbor, honoring parents, not stealing, and so on. And then 
he asked Jesus one more question. Who is my neighbor? Well, he wants to justify himself. He wants to make himself look good and right to anybody that's gathered there listening to this conversation. The lawyer's question is a good legal question. Someone should understand, I suppose, who their neighbor is. And so under the same legal system, they also want to understand who their neighbor is not. But Jesus is not speaking here in the context of a legal system. Instead, Jesus' response is in the context of love. According to the book of Leviticus, love has to extend beyond the people in one's group. Leviticus 19 insists on loving the stranger as well. And so instead of answering the question directly, Jesus goes into a parable. And many of the parables, this one included, like so many great stories, can make those who are comfortable uncomfortable. And they often comfort those who have known both sorrow and heartache. A great story engages us because it it challenges our presuppositions and our prejudgments that we carry. The ones we carry about ourselves and the world in which we live. And they invite us into personal and honest responsibility. And that's one of the main reasons Jesus told such great and piercing stories or parables. The late Fred Craddock, ranked by Newsweek as one of the greatest American preachers, tells the following story in his book, Craddock Stories. Every Christmas, I used to go home to West Tennessee. An old high school chum of mine, and I called him Buck, had a restaurant in town. And every year it was the same. I'd go to the restaurant and say, Merry Christmas, Buck. And he'd give me a piece of pie and a cup of coffee for free. And every year it was the same. I went in, Merry Christmas, Buck. But this year, but this year, he said, let's go somewhere for coffee. What's the matter? Isn't this a restaurant? He said, sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I wonder. Let's, let's go. So we went somewhere else for coffee. We sat there, and pretty soon he said, did you see the curtain? I said, Buck, I saw the curtain. I always see the curtain. Now, what he meant by the curtain was this. They have a number of buildings in that little town that are called shotgun buildings. They're long buildings with two entrances, front and back. One is off the street, and one is off the alley. In Buck's restaurant and other restaurants in town, the entrances were separated by a curtain with a kitchen in the middle. And if you were white, you came in off the street. And if you were black, you came in off the alley. And he said again, did you see the curtain? The curtain has to come down. Good, I said, bring it down. He said, that's easy for you to say. Come into town once a year and tell me how to run my business. I said, okay, then leave it up. He said, I can't leave it up. Well, then take it down. I can't take it down. After a while, he said, if I take that curtain down, I'll lose a lot of my customers. But if I leave the curtain up, I lose my soul. This story, like other great stories, demands a moment of silence to let that sink in. If I take that curtain down, I lose a lot of my customers. If I leave that curtain up, I lose my soul. Take a moment and reflect on that. What do these stories about the curtain and the Good Samaritan invite us into? The late Irish priest and author John O'Donohue shares thoughts about where this type of wondering and questioning can lead us. Even if it's a place that might be uncomfortable, It's important to go there. And so I guess the question is, how does this lead us to that place where we can live this day, compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, and generous in love? Craddock's story and the story of the Good Samaritan, they don't make things tidy for us. In both stories, the prejudgments we carry about ourselves, about those who are different than we are, about those who are on the margins in this world that we live in, those stories invite us to be honest about our personal responsibility. And at the heart of both of these stories is a man torn and a decision to be made. 
In the Good Samaritan story, it's about being torn between laws and love and torn between rituals and compassion. And in both stories, the story of the curtain and the story of the Good Samaritan, no decision is a decision. It's a decision between what is expected by those around them and a decision to do that which is morally right. A decision to live out a biblical sense of justice. A decision that will bring light and life to someone on the margin and in need and light and life to the one's very own soul. Or to take that path which is expected. A path that may be at least monetarily, if not socially beneficial to oneself. A decision in each of these two stories faces each of the men. Now, I think most likely they already knew what decision they would make. It's just that sometimes for them, as well as for all of us, it can take a while for our decisions to be lived out. We all know what it's like to be torn. At the end of the Good Samaritan story, Jesus asked the lawyer one final question. Which of these three was a neighbor? And the lawyer said, the one doing mercy for him. And Jesus says to him, go and do likewise. Now, it doesn't tell us what the lawyer did. But it does leave us with the question, what will we do? For me, the question to unpack here is, what is the reservoir that gives us the energy and the courage to make life-giving, compassionate, and redemptive decisions? And it's so easy to lose sight of, in some ways, just how little the step into that decision And simple the gesture could be. Our world and lives are full of curtains. We act as if that curtain somehow makes us safer. If we can't see the other person or we pass by on the other side of the road, we act as if we're somehow protected from them or their need, acting as if their need is not my concern. If that's the case... What do we do with the words of Jesus when he says, when I was hungry, you fed me, lonely, you visited me. When you did this to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And when you didn't do this to the least of my brothers, you didn't do it to me. Do we think that because someone has a different life narrative, a story that we don't relate to or understand, that their need is invalid, or that their need is perhaps just too inconvenient for us? What do we do with these words from the book of James? For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you don't supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So we, and I mean in that we, I, we curtain people in. We curtain people out, both literally and spiritually. And when we do that, no matter if it is intentional or unintentional, it can lead to grief and fear and division and sometimes even violence. In the story of the Good Samaritan, the lawyer's question actually misses the mark when asking, who is my neighbor? He's actually finding, trying to find a polite way of saying, Who's not my neighbor? Or who who do I not have to love? Or who? Who can I actually hate? And Jesus responds with a twist to that culture, and he says, no one. That's right, no one falls outside of this love and compassion. Not the Jew, not the Samaritan, not the terrorist, not the immigrant, not the Muslim, not the Hispanic, not the Republican, not the Democrat. Can we take these stories to heart? Think of all the reasons we have to cross to the other side of the road. Think of all the reasons that we have to take down the curtains. Who are we trying to please or impress? What is it that we're afraid of? But here's the deal. I do know that when I'm torn, I live anxious and restless And I get exhausted. Which means sometimes I spend so much energy, I work so hard to keep that curtain up, even though I can't explain why. There's so many curtains, so many walls, and so many other sides of the road that divide us. 
I, I wish I could tell you that it was all easier. There are plenty of areas in my life where I need to take the curtain down. The curtain of suspicion. The curtain of anger. The curtain of public opinion or fear or old hurts and grudges. The curtain of an unwillingness to trust. When I keep the curtain up, it ultimately blocks out the light and love that God pours into me from permeating my heart and radiating from my soul and prevents me from simply letting my light shine. As long as there are curtains, I cannot receive. As long as there are curtains, I cannot give. As long as there are curtains, we cannot connect. As long as there are curtains, I cannot be a place of sanctuary and grace and inclusion and sufficiency and healing. On one hand, the story of the Good Samaritan has universal appeal about our moral responsibility. But if we peel back the layers to its first century audience and meaning, we discover it is bigger than just moral responsibility. It is actually a story about how we love God through loving others. It points out all the ways that we preclude or prevent ourselves from living lives of gracious compassion for others. And whenever we deny ourselves living out of this love and compassion, we will never be fully alive. It is far better for us to acknowledge that each person, no matter who they are, is created in the image of God than to think otherwise, than to act otherwise. So I invite you to strive with me to tear down the curtains, to live by the simplest command Jesus ever gave, which is to love God with our whole self and love our neighbor as ourself. This will be all-consuming and will leave us little time for anything else. Can we trust God enough to give us the strength and courage to care for our enemies? who are also our neighbors? Can we find ways to bind up their wounds rather than blow up their reputations? And can we put into practice not leaving any wounded traveler on the road? Amen.